Hey everybody, we're going to work a problem about epistasis. Uh, I thought I'd start with the simplest one, um, and it's the one we talked about in class, and it's pertaining to the coat color inheritance of Labrador dogs. Now, we're ignoring silver labs. We don't care about the silver labs, and we don't care whether they're American or English Labradors. Yeah. All right, so as usual, I'm going to just work in Photoshop here. So I have uh, control over uh, some layers and some colors so I can kind of try to keep things organized. Um, uh, a lot of times when I do exam questions on epistasis, I end up um, showing you some sort of biochemical diagram. Uh, in this case, I didn't. This is actually from a, boy, the, this exam is several years old. So uh, I'll just show you how to kind of set up the basic uh, problem and then we'll go from there. I'll probably post another couple of videos using different epistasis examples. All right, if you recall, epistasis is the masking of the effect of one locus depending on the genotype of another locus. And the locus that does the masking is the epistatic locus. And the locus that is masked is called the hypostatic locus. Uh, this question doesn't ask that kind of stuff, but I, I like to sort of clarify that because sometimes there's embedded knowledge that I expect of the student when there's a question like this. So let's sort of draw this out uh, or, or sort of kind of consider what we know. So we've got two loci, the B locus here and the E locus here, right? Uh, B locus encodes pigment color, so there's either dominant black or recessive brown alleles. But the deposition of those pigments is controlled by the E locus. The dominant allele allows pigment deposition while the recessive allele prevents it. And if pigment deposition is prevented, you end up with a yellow lab. All right. So like I usually do on exam questions, I try to walk the students through some of the steps. And so in this first part of the question, I just ask what color is a dog that is heterozygous at both of these loci? And so Typically what I do to answer a question like this is I just uh, write down the heterozygous genotype. So in this case, and again, my handwriting on these tablets isn't fantastic, but you'll have to just bear with me. Also, apparently my tablet is somewhat tilted, so. Wow, I write like a second grader. That is its genotype. If it's heterozygous, it means it has a dominant allele for the pigment color, which means it's black. And because it has a dominant allele for the pet deposition locus, it means that black pigment can be deposited. And so this dog is black. All right, so that's two points. Uh, the hard part of this question is if we breed together two of these dogs, i.e., that is, perform a dye hybrid cross, again, here's an example of assumed embedded knowledge on your part, what phenotypic ratio do we expect? By the way, I mean, a lot of students say to me, I ask them, how's it going in the class? And, and they say to me, oh, it's mostly review from 115 and stuff. It is, right? And in fact, it is review from 115 in lecture to the point where I assume you remember what this means. And that's not the point of the question. So assuming you remember what a dihybrid cross is, we're going to wonder what would be the phenotypic ratio we would expect from a large litter of these dogs. So a dihybrid cross looks like this. Right? Now, some of you would be tempted to perhaps do a Punnett square. Please don't do that. It's going to take you way too long. You'll run out of time on the exam. Uh, Punnett squares are fine for very simple single locus problems and things like that. Beyond that, I think you need to get a little bit more sophisticated in your thinking. So uh, if you recall, there are four phenotypic categories that occur in a typical dihybrid cross. And so what I suggest when you write, when you work an epistasis problem that involves a dihybrid cross is write them down using the allelic nomenclature that is pertaining to the particular problem. In this case, I'm saying write it down in terms of B's and E's. So the four phenotypic categories are some form of 
double dominant. Remember we use these dashes to indicate that. So this could be big B, little b, or big B, big B. It doesn't matter. The phenotype is the same. Some combination of homozygous recessive and dominant at the other locus. The opposite of that. And then finally, double homozygous recessive. I am really struggling with handwriting right now. It's bugging me, but anyway, we'll work it out, okay? Now, if you recall, these occur in a very specific expected phenotypic ratio. They occur in a 9 to 3 to 3 to 1 ratio. Now, if you go back to your textbook example and you look at Mendel's P's and the dihybrid cross we walked through uh, when Mendel was doing all of that work, they discovered it was like yellow peas and wrinkled peas and that kind of stuff, 9 to 3 to 3 to 1. The thing with epistasis is a lot of times it will be modifications of these categories to produce the final phenotypic ratio. So what I typically do to work these problems is nothing more than write down the colors of these different categories. Now we've already established this B-E- that's black. We established that up here. It's actually why I ask you this question up at the top. These dogs will be black. The dominant B means they produce black pigment. The dominant E means they deposit the pigment. Okay. Now, these dogs, because they're homozygous recessive for little b, they produce brown pigment. And that brown pigment can be deposited because they have a dominant allele at the E locus. So these dogs would be brown. These dogs produce black pigment. However, it can't be deposited in the hair. This is the uh, masking locus here. It masks the variation here. So we have epistasis. These dogs would be yellow. These dogs produce brown pigment. Can't be deposited in the hair because two copies of the little e allele makes the dog's fur yellow. Okay. So, the correct answer to this epistasis problem, I'm just asking you, what is the phenotypic ratio that we expect? To answer that, you would add these up, and you would just say 9 black to 3 brown to, and I'm running out of space, 4 yellow. Remember, this is a subtle application of the addition rule for working with probabilities. How can you get a yellow lab with this particular cross? It can be this genotype or this genotype. So you add those together. Okay, so that's a very, very basic epistasis problem that we actually worked in class. Uh, and this is one I used on an old exam. In another epistasis video, we'll do some more clever uh, and fun examples with dragons and weird stuff like that. So hope this helps uh, and as always if there are particular topics you want me to cover or anything like that just shoot me a text or an email or comment on these videos or whatever it is you kids do these days. Sound good? Okay, I'm going to reach over and turn off the recording now.